So today I'm going to tell you about Gram. Uh, it's a system we built with the ultimate goal of clock synchronization. Uh, so to get there, we had to learn a lot about clocks, and I'm going to take you through some of our adventures. Uh, so this is work I did with uh, my co-author, Ali, at VMware Research. So why should we care about clocks? Well, they're critical for building a distributed system. One of the key problems in a distributed system is agreeing on the order of events, which is exactly what a clock allows us to do. In an ideal world, we would use wall clock time. It's the same everywhere in the world after we make time zone adjustments, and we could even order real world observations based on it. But as almost every distributed system textbook will tell you, it turns out that clocks drift unevenly. So if you let clocks run free in a server, uh, in servers, they'll slowly drift apart. Lamport recognized this in 1978 and developed logical clocks so that distributed systems could be built without relying on wall clocks. But even today, uh, logical clocks are the foundation of nearly every distributed system. Unlike wall clocks, logical clocks require multiple communication steps to establish and maintain. Moreover, modern optimizations can make logical clocks really hard to reason about. As services become faster and more geodistributed, the cost of this communication increases. So for instance, in a geodistributed setting, each round of communication might take 100 milliseconds in each direction. Since establishing logical clocks usually requires multiple rounds of this communication, it could take over a second to establish a logical clock across continents. Spanner is one of the first widely known works that revisited the use of wall clocks by leveraging GPS clocks at each server. After accounting for clock uncertainty, Spanner enables servers to, um, across continents to agree on the time used to serve snapshots. More recent work within the data center, such as Wiegand's and Sundial, improve synchronization even further. Uh, they enable microsecond scale accuracy um, with machine learning techniques and specialized hardware. The focus on these systems is to make clocks more accurate by improving the accuracy of synchronization itself and to increase how frequently systems are synchronized. A common theme we observed among these works is that they assume that the local clocks of the computers being synchronized are completely unreliable so that if synchronization is lost, it's assumed that the clocks have failed. But the clocks keep some time. It's not like your clocks go crazy the second you lose synchronization. It turns out that the main reason clocks drift in the first place is because of temperature. For instance, clocks in warm servers generally run faster than clocks in cold servers, and the loads vary in each server. Modern servers are full of temperature sensors. If you run a sensor check on a modern server, you'll find temperature sensors in the CPU, DRAM, hard disks, and even things that you might not expect, like the power supply and the optical drive in the server. So we wanted to ask the question, could we use these sensors to correct the clock drift of the local clock? Now, this isn't a new idea at all. In fact, our system is named after George Graham, a clockmaker who built clocks for temperature to correct for temperature variations all the way back in 1726. So in this picture, you can see him uh, sitting in front of his clock, um, which uses a vial of mercury to compensate for the effects of uh, the metal expanding and shrinking. Uh, as the temperature changes. So our solution, Graham, is a, uh, takes this idea and scales it to commodity servers, which haven't actually been designed for these corrections at all. And even when we don't have a precise external clock to check that the time is even correct in the first place. So now that I introduced why clocks are important for distributed systems and, and how Graham tries to improve them by correcting for temperature errors, I'm going to tell you next about how we came to understand clock drift. Uh, with that understanding, we're able to characterize the relationship between the temperature and clock and automate the discovery of the curves in this relationship. Finally, I'll show you some of the evaluations that demonstrate uh, Graham's effectiveness. So from a hardware perspective, we know that clocks are actually relatively stable. Clocks and commodity servers are driven by quartz crystals, such as the one shown here. Um, not only does the crystal drive the wall clock of the server, this crystal usually drives the CPU itself. If the clock was really, really unstable, your server would probably crash. Um, the servers, uh, the crystals that servers use um, usually have a data sheet that specifies how stable they are. 
most common server crystals uh, have a stability of about 20 ppm. And uh, the units are parts per million. Um, so you can think of one ppm as one microsecond per second of drift. So uh, in the worst case scenario, this uh, 20 ppm crystal would drift about two seconds a day. So it's also important to note that this uh, frequency stability is over the entire operating temperature range. Now, most state-of-the-art systems like Spanner and Sundial, which I mentioned earlier, assume a 200 ppm drift. That's 10x more than what this crystal actually specifies. So my co-author's first reaction to this was one of surprise. Uh, you know, 200 ppm is really, really bad if you've worked with clocks. Even an out-of-tune mechanical wristwatch would only be off by maybe 10 seconds a day or 100 ppm. So we wanted to really know where is this error coming from? So we examined a wide range of literature on crystals to determine the source of crystal drift. Uh, and the sources are summarized in this table. And we found that drift could be divided into two major categories. Static drift doesn't change with environmental conditions. For instance, since crystals are cut using a mechanical process, there is some error or t uh, tolerance in the way they cut it. So this is usually really easy to fix. Um, if the crystal vibrates at 24 0.999 megahertz, then we can learn it and you know, correct for it. Um, crystals also age, but over, and over time, crystals don't vibrate at the same frequency because they're mechanical devices. But this change usually happens in the first year. What we were really concerned about were sources of dynamic drift. We were particularly concerned about sources that we didn't account for that might explain this 200 ppm error. But what we found was that the other sources of error were actually very minimal compared to temperature. For instance, you can see that if I changed the voltage, we would have to essentially fry the server before it would have to have really any effect. And servers and data centers generally aren't moving or subject to time dilation, which is actually a serious concern for satellites that are flying into space. So with that information, we said, OK, let's just see how bad things are in a real server and get hands on. So we hooked up a nice GPI synchronized clock to our server, and we started seeing a problem right away, um, as you can see in this error chart. We had blips all over our graph, and this was jitter. So to turn, it turns out to measure a clock, um, to measure clock drift, you actually need to compare the computer's clock to an accurate external clock. And this is really a lot harder than it seems. Modern computers are really, really asynchronous, so delivering an external clock um, on time requires quite a bit of work. On the servers we used, uh, we can only reliably deliver a high priority, low latency interrupt via the serial port. And eventually, we devised this dual interrupt scheme and that filtered out all the jitter and gave us relatively clean grass. But we found so many issues from C states to kernel packages that were giving us jitter all over the place. With an accurate external clock finally attached, we were able to observe that this crystal actually behaved really like the data sheet told us, that we're able to obtain a 0.5 ppm change um, per hour, and that roughly corresponded to the temperature change we're seeing um, on the server over that period of time. So one of the key things to observe on this graph, I know numbers are a little small, is that while the error is around negative um, 22 ppm, um, you can see that it's actually quite stable, and this is the static error that we can filter out that I was talking about earlier. So armed with the ability to measure time, we then tried to formalize what we were trying to improve on, um, what, what we call holdover time. Holdover time is the amount of time that a clock can remain accurate without exceeding some uncertainty bound. If we assume that clock drift is really bad, then our only option is to reduce this holdover time. So if we wanted to go down to 100 nanoseconds of uncertainty and have a microsecond scale clock, then we need to decrease our holdover time to 0.5 milliseconds. And that means we have to synchronize a lot more frequently, which is exactly what these existing systems try to do. Synchronizing every half a millisecond, for example, requires handling 2,000 low jitter IO operations per second. And that means interrupting the CPU 2,000 times a second. However, if we characterize the clock instead, we could potentially achieve the same uncertainty without um, um, having to have the same burden of synchronization, which is exactly what Graham is trying to achieve. So now that we understand clock drift, let's talk about how we characterize the relationship between the clock and the temperature. 
So we first discovered that manipulating the temperature environment of the server was a pain because of things like fans. So instead, we focused our characterization experiments on the Raspberry Pi platform. So don't worry, we're gonna go back and apply our learnings back to commodity servers, but this nice platform allowed us to do things like point hair dryers at it and dunk it into uh, ice buckets for rapid cooling and heating. From the literature, we know that clock drift is a third order polynomial equation, which looks something like this on a crystal data sheet. One thing to note is that the negative part of the curve, negative 40 degrees, is a range that most servers probably aren't running at. We are able to generate this curve on this Pi by um, exposing the Pi to different temperatures, pointing a hairdryer at it, dunking in an ice bucket, and referencing this error against uh, GP, uh, accurate GPS time. We found that the same pie, on the same pie, um, the curve was usually repeatable, even though uh, the temperature curve isn't the same for each one of these tests. So because we were manually subjecting this pie to different temperatures, the temperature curves were just wildly different. Um, but we obtained the same curve every single time we ran the tests. The, um, however, we did find out that on different devices, even those of the same model, so we tested, for example, two different Raspberry Pi 4 B pluses, which had the same crystal, um, they all had different curves. Um, in hindsight, this is obvious because each crystal has its own error and is cut incorrect or cut to the, to the tolerance. So we actually had to characterize each device even if they have the same crystal. We also discovered that the curve changed slightly over time. So we ran the test over about six months apart and we discovered the curve shifted ever so slightly, likely due to aging. So this curve also needs to be updated over time. Armed with a way to discover the curves, we now needed a way to automate the process. So in a real data center setting, we can't expect precision time to be available and distributed to every machine. So we decided to come up with a method that works over NTP and hope that with enough measurements, the error would essentially cancel itself out. And NTP provides at best milliseconds worth of accuracy. So we applied some linear algebra, some least squares fit. The details are in the paper. But essentially, we aggregate the temperatures observed between synchronizations to generate a set of linear equations and solve for the temperature constants. Um, using NTP over a WAN connection, we found that the system was able to converge um, where convergence is uh, within 20 ppm of error over, um, after 48 hours. And the NTP curve we generated within, within, was within 0.5 ppm of the curve that we generated using high precision GPS signals. So now that we've automated discovering the curves, I'll present some of the experiments uh, that we uh, show Graham in action. So using our generated temperature curves, we're able to quantify the benefits of um, our compensation scheme. At time zero, we shut off synchronization on the left. Uh, the graph on the left shows the time drift that results from the, um, uh, the pi, or sorry, yeah, the system being exposed to the temperature trace on the right. Uh, which we felt could be representative of like HVAC um, overheating. As you can see, it rises to the milliseconds level, um, almost exceeding, oh, sorry. The solid red line is uh, basically if, uh, without compensation, and you can see that it rises really, really quickly um, to almost five milliseconds of drift um, to uh, within 10 seconds, um, the point which uh, gram only exceeds uh, one microsecond of drift. For most of the tests, we're able to maintain about 100 ppb of error, which is uh, 300 times better, or 200 times better than the advertised temperature error on, on the crystal. And um, at uh, S3, though, um, we have a really high slope uh, where we're actually pointing a hairdryer at the system at the point, and that's where we get a 300 ppb slope. Um, so, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is that our system might not have been doing a lot of learning at the very high temperature range, but 300 ppb is even still quite good um, and orders of magnitude better than Spanner's assumptions. Um, we also wanted to test the effects of a thermal shock event. So, uh, so we are able to test uh, pointing a hairdryer directly at the Pi's crystal for 25 seconds, raising the temperature uh, at roughly two degrees Celsius a second. Uh, the time drift never exceeds more than 10 microseconds over the initial 25 second slope, and um, that's a drift of only 0.4 ppm. Once the temperature slope uh, decreases, we're able to maintain that time without exceeding the initial 10 microseconds of error. Uh, 
Um, without correction, the system accumulates over a millisecond of error over the same time period. Uh, while we find that our results generally translated well into commodity servers, uh, they um, have the additional challenge of having multiple sensors. So our solution identifies the best sensor um, or the sensor that has the closest fit to the uh, corrected time um, by tracking these experiments and learning these linear equations in parallel. So in this experiment, the dim sensor has the best fit and you can see that the ambient temperature sensor and the chip set sensor perform admirably at first, but they begin to deviate over time because of non-uniform heat distribution in the, in the server. We also applied this, uh, a random load to the server, um, varying me memory heavy workloads and CPU heavy workloads um, in order to um, see which sensor performed the best. Um, so we found that the DIMM sensors generally perform the best, maybe because they have thin PCBs and respond very quickly to environmental changes. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we found that it was very hard to accurately measure clock drift. Comparing the reference clock to a CPU requires software, which is asynchronous, um, and um, introduces error, especially when the system is loaded. But if you um, get an accurate clock, then we can see that clocks are relatively stable. Um, and Graham shows that we can actually measure this drift temperature relationship and correct it. Uh, with temperature correction, we're able to achieve 100 ppb uncertainty and a 2,000 x improvement from 200 ppm. Thanks, and if you have any questions.